So good to be with you today. Um, if you haven't yet met me, my name is Dave. I am a part of the team here. And by my funky hair and my cool blundstones, you can tell I am the youth pastor. <laughs> no, I actually am very happy uh, to be here. And I'm happy that our youth are actually in the service today. And some of them may be like, no, don't talk about us. But I'm actually really overjoyed uh, that our young people are here. And I want you to know that this is for you. The Word of God is for you as well. And so I pray that I can at least um, encourage our young people throughout the sermon. So you get to be included in that as well. Now, uh, here we are in this amazing series in Matthew. And many of you know we're in the series Kingdom Come, right? You know the series we're in? And it's, yes, an announcement that the kingdom of God has indeed come. The kingdom of heaven has come. But it's also an incredible invitation to go deeper into that kingdom lifestyle with Jesus. So I hope that situates you a little bit as we come to God's word this morning. Now, I'm going to start with a story, um, and it's a real life story. So a number of years ago, uh, this happened. Now, it can happen in any church, I think, pretty much. Uh, So there's this rather large church, and this rather rough guy, you know, comes in to the church. He's looking a little rough. Maybe he's a homeless guy. He looks a little different. They're like, who is this guy? And, and people are kind of like staying away from him. They're not kind of close. They're kind of like, let's, let's keep our distance from this guy. He's trying to greet people. They're like, uh, not so much. Thank you very much. And he kind of sits in the back and he, he's kind of by himself. And everyone else gathers around. They're doing their thing. And, and uh, the elders of the church, they get up and they make an announcement. They're like, hey, we have a great announcement today. And the announcement is, our new pastor has been called to our church. This is fantastic. We're going to welcome him up to the front. And the rough-looking guy gets up and walks to the front, takes off some of his rough kind of garb and says, hello. And then he starts preaching. Now, the content of his preaching probably has a lot to do with like, hey, let's treat each other a certain way in the church. Like, we missed, missed the boat on this a little bit. But here's the thing. Here's my point with the story. This is not the guy they were expecting to lead them. Not the guy at all they were expecting. And I say this because sometimes, if we're honest, this is kind of how we see Jesus. He's not exactly who we expect. We have all sorts of unhelpful ideas of who he is. And so today, I think Jesus, as Ken has already said, really challenges us with that question. Who is Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Well, I encourage you now, if you've uh, closed your Bibles or if you have a a Bible app, you can open your your app. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16. If you open your Bibles with me and stand when you're ready, if you're able, we're going to read through Matthew 16, starting at verse 13 to verse 20. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated now. Now, I love that Jesus makes this really easy. Uh, We're going to look at our passage in two simple ways. The two questions that Jesus asks. First, who do people? Who do people say? And secondly, who do you say? Who do you say? So, starting with, who do people say? Now, Jesus arrives in the area of Caesarea Philippi. Now, if you're that kind of person who likes to know the context... Well, this is a place known for kind of cults of the emperor, like worshiping the emperor, the Caesar, 
and also the party goat god Pan. So that's kind of their thing. Now, there's also a really impressive water spring, if you like that kind of thing. It's an impressive water spring. is very well known for this area. But what I want to say is this area, like many other areas, are very preoccupied. They're very distracted by the things around them in the worship they have. And just like for us, we're surrounded by many, many preoccupations that distract our focus on the questions that Jesus gives us today. Now, if you ask the average person in North America, so adult, uh, young person, youth, if you ask the average young person, if you kind of made a big survey, and there's a group called Barna that did this, they asked thousands and thousands of people that question, who, who is this Jesus? And this is what it kind of looks like. And if you don't know Barna, it's just kind of a, a research group. But they do uh, well-trusted research and surveys. So this is not just something out of the blue. So who is Jesus? Well, most, it seems, would say he was a person who lived in history. Okay, that's good. We're, we're on the same page. He is a person, and he did live in history. And many would believe that he was a spiritual leader, but actually nothing more. Okay, that's many belief out there. And a lot of people would believe that Jesus did some good, right? Oh, he did some good, but he also maybe did some bad. So maybe he sinned. And quite a few people would not agree that Jesus and the cross are the way to heaven and eternity. So that's kind of a, a sort of wide dispersal of what's kind of going on in the minds of people out there in North America. So when Jesus asked this question to his disciples in verse 13, who do people say that the Son of Man is? That's the question. He's kind of asking widely. Now, here's a side note, and this is for the young people who like to go on their phones and check things. This is actually cool. Um, Jesus is actually asking a deeper question here. He's kind of being a little cheeky. He, he's asking a deeper question than he might originally think. When Jesus is calling himself the Son of Man, did you catch that? He's not just saying, who do people say that me, Jesus? He's saying, the Son of Man. He actually asks that. On the surface, a Son of Man is kind of like a human being, which kind of, that makes sense, right? Son of people, right? Um, it's a human being with all the complicated and complex elements of humanity, and yeah, that's true. And I like what John Piper says. He says, the term son of man doesn't merely align him with humanity. Not merely, does, not just. It's probably taken from Daniel 7. And if you read that chapter, you'll see that the son of man is a very exalted figure. Not just a human figure, but an exalted figure. And it was Jesus' favorite designation of himself. He, he called himself that all the time. So, when Jesus asks this question, he's very intentionally calling himself both fully human, yes, but he's also giving us a little wink, 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 that there's so much more. There's just so much more. And so with this question, he's leading us, he's leading us to really dig in and think about who he is. So he asks the disciples, right, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And again, he's kind of giving that getting that average answer. Okay, here's a bunch of different answers to that. Now, here's the people who've been around Jesus for a while. They've seen the amazing things he's done, miraculous things he's done, and they've heard him. Think Sermon on the Mount, the beautiful words of the Sermon on the Mount. And honestly, the answers that the disciples give are not too bad. They're pretty okay. They're, they're a really good start for us. They're not the worst answers in the world. Listen to what they say. Verse 14, and they say, this is what people say, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Well, here's the thing, they seem to be seeing Jesus as one of the greats. Maybe a bit of a preacher of doom and gloom, because those guys are a bit doomy gloomy, right? But one of the greats. He's a, he's a prophet. That's, that's a big deal. What some might be saying then is basically what Herod, the king, is saying about Jesus. He's saying, he is John the Baptist. Now, if you kind of know a little bit about John the Baptist, John the Baptist was a prophet of God's people who announced and pronounced the message of repentance and preparation, getting ready for the Messiah, right? But he was a strange figure, right? He, he looked a little funny, smelled a little funny, right? He was a strange figure in appearance, but he was powerful in his condemnation 
of the culture that doesn't take God seriously. And he didn't make exceptions for rich or poor or powerful or weak. No, he was bringing this message of hope and repentance and renewal of life. Now, people were saying then that Jesus was like his cousin, John. But if you know, by this time in the Gospel of Matthew, John had actually already been killed. Why? Because he was criticizing those in power. So today, as we kind of look at John the Baptist and think, well, who is this guy? He seems bold and courageous, right? Doing good, but really strange, right? Very passionate, but maybe keep your distance from this guy. He's a little odd. Don't want to get too close. And I think at that day, and maybe like us, many of us might see Jesus in this light too. Bold and courageous. Good. But maybe we want to keep our distance because he's a little bit out of what we expect. Can we really trust him? Even Jesus himself in Matthew 11 says that John is one of the greats, very much the Elijah-like prophet who announces the Messiah. This is what Jesus says. Truly I say to you, those born among women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. That's pretty high praise. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Clearly, John the Baptist was one of the greats, and that's where they're saying Jesus is kind of like that. But Jesus is also saying there is something greater. So how about Jesus being compared to maybe Elijah, whom we can read about in 1 Kings, or Jeremiah, who if you open your Bibles, there's a book all through, uh, all in the Old Testament that is by Jeremiah and about Jeremiah. These are these two very bold and powerful prophets of the Old Testament who were often kind of pushed away and distanced because they spoke so strongly against the anti-God authorities of their day. They kind of spoke against the kings. They spoke against those who would reject God. And after doing the most amazing things through God's Spirit, with everything seemingly against him, Elijah actually became very fearful, didn't he? And he ran away. And Jeremiah, if you read about him, he was imprisoned and mistreated for his faith. So like in those days, we can admire the prophets for their boldness, for their willingness to speak God's word, often with a great and very high cost. God chose these human beings to lead others, to share wisdom, to speak very challenging truth. Like in the days of the prophets, do we see them? And maybe see Jesus as kind of spiritual coaches or consultants. Hey, you, you tell me some stuff. I want to hear the wisdom, but I love the boldness and compassion, but I don't want to get all of the message. Just I'll take bits and pieces of the message. I want to take or leave your guidance because the consequences, if I follow everything, might be people hating us, maybe violence isolation, or even in some situations around the world, prison. And I don't know, this is maybe even for our younger people in, in uh, the congregation. If you're listening to podcasts and various platforms, and, and yes, for us older folks, books as well, even Christian ones, do you notice that there's so many bold and passionate folks showcasing so much out there? advising and telling us how to live. And some of those podcasts and those platforms seem actually pretty healthy, and you're like, I'm learning stuff. This is great. And some seem that they're a whole lot of self-serving and even a bit questionable. Now, here's all these platforms. Is this how we see Jesus? Maybe as talented and wise as a teacher, but one voice among so many other coaches and consultants. And if I only see Jesus like a great teacher, I can choose what I do with his teaching. And so like the people of Jesus' day, they may have seen him as one of the greats, but they kind of wanted someone different. Now the punchline to all this thinking is this. 
Jesus tells us that John was the last great prophet. John the Baptist was the last great prophet. The Elijah, the actual Elijah who was promised. And John was preparing the way for Jesus. And as we learn, coming to our next question, Jesus is far greater than we could have imagined. So here's our next part, second part. Jesus saying, okay, there's all those other voices, but who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus? Verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? I'm going to slow it down. This might actually be the most important question we could ask. Because this, the answer to this question leads to God's presence and his favor, the building blocks of eternal community, the open door to life with God and all the joy and glory that brings. And this question is deeply personal. Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? There are all these other voices out there, but you, who do you say that I am? Now, I've had the pleasure for many years of leading and helping in Alpha. We've uh, talked about that. We've done Youth Alpha here, and it was amazing. And Alpha does this. It brings people from all walks of life, doesn't it? It kind of brings people who have been in the church maybe a long time and are asking some big questions. But it also brings in people maybe who have hardly ever heard about Jesus. Maybe someone mentioned Jesus to them. They're like, who is this Jesus? And they're like, hey, Come and find out, right? Now, as the the Alpha program does, and as in the church we do this too, we lead people through a journey of an introducing Jesus. Hey, come, take a look. And we share what he says and what that means. In the Alpha program, this is always my favorite question. Who is Jesus? Who do you say that I am? And how about for you? Can you hear Jesus asking you this same question? Who do you say that I am? As you think about it, our answers reveal where we are with Jesus. Where we are with Jesus. Now, for all of us, as Peter answers this question, in particular for our young people, I want to ask you this question. Do you agree with Peter? Are you like, okay, Peter, bring it. I'm going to have a kind of a critical thinking. Are you saying something that I can actually agree with? And I want you to think about that. Because listen to what Peter says. So here's Jesus. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay, what's he saying here? Peter says that Jesus is the promised Messiah the Savior, the King, the unique Son of the God who is eternally alive. In a kind of summary, let's let's put it this way. Jesus is who He says He is. He's the promised one that all the Bible is pointing to. He's the promised and anointed King in the line of David, come to lead God's people. He's the one who's come to save the world, come to save you and me. And he's God's distinct and special and divine son. And this son is of the eternal father. And if you think about that father, because he is who he says he is and he is living, his life kind of pushes all other things to the side of worship and turns them into idolatry. Now, this is an amazing gospel description of Jesus. It's, wow, it's so rich and deep and powerful and clear, very, very clear. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Pretty clear, right? Now, if we know Peter at all, he's not really known for his clarity. He's known for his boldness, and he jumps into things, including water and trying to walk on it. He he jumps into things big, right? But clarity isn't his strong suit. And so Jesus, in his response to Peter, shows us how this is happening inside of Peter. And even in us, 
in how we respond to who Jesus truly is. Can you see Jesus for who he truly is? Listen to these beautiful words in the scriptures. So Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him. And listen to what he says. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And Jesus is saying, this revolution, re- revelation It's also revolutionary. Revelation, or being able to truly answer this question that he asks, being able to do that is absolutely life-changing. Yes, for Peter, and first for him, but also for us and all his disciples. Now, Jesus speaks these three important outcomes. I just want us to hear. There's lots of things there, but three important outcomes of knowing him as the Christ, the Son of the living God. The first, you notice, is, is blessing. The second is something to do with the church. And the third has to do with the kingdom, the blessing. It it has to do with the relationship with the Father, the church, this this gospel building blocks that defy even death, even the gates of hell, and the kingdom under the rule of God and not the rule of sin, the world, the devil, and death. So blessing. Jesus pronounces this blessing over Peter. Did you hear it? Blessed are you, right? We can know blessing as kind of like a churchy word, can't we? It's like, yeah, it's the the favor and prosperity given by God, maybe. But Jesus increases our understanding of true blessing. So for Peter, and Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus is saying, this blessing is the Father's presence, His power, and His revelation or revealing truth. Jesus is saying that Peter didn't just come up with this like, oh, Peter's really clever. No, He's saying He can't do that. It is only by the power and the presence and the revelation of God through the Holy Spirit that we can see Jesus for who he is, and come to trust and believe in him. So how about for you? Now, if you're drawing to the conclusion, or you've drawn to the conclusion that Jesus is who he says he is, the Christ, the Son of the living God, then you and I have the power and the presence and the revelation of God with us and in us. And if you've said yes to Jesus, you are truly blessed with this incredible gift. And God is, give, is with you and with me in power, and he's speaking and revealing himself to you in his love. And if you haven't yet come to this place of who Jesus is, it gives us this beautiful opportunity to pray and to ask God to be present with you with his power and reveal himself to you in Jesus. Now, as I say that, many have heard that before. Pray that God would reveal himself to you. And over the many years as a pastor and youth pastor and in the Alpha program, I have seen this over and over and over again. You pray that God would reveal himself, and God is so faithful That's my story, and that's probably many of your stories as well. God, reveal yourself to us in Jesus. And it could be your story too, if you're asking. So, Peter and all Jesus' disciples, including you and I, are blessed with the power and the presence and the revelation of who Jesus is. And what does Jesus declared over Peter. He declares some things over Peter. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, 
You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's so poetic and powerful. The gates of hell shall not. Just so cool. So for Peter, Jesus declares over him that he is a new person. And that new person has a new purpose, being built into the church or God's people. And as Simon Peter declares the truth of who Jesus is, the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus renames Simon from being son of Jonah or John as Peter or the rock. Not Dwayne the rock, but like an actual rock. Peter is the first of millions upon millions and millions of beautiful bricks and rocks that will make up the people of God, Jesus' church. This church, this gathering of God's people are under the power of Jesus, His death on the cross for us, taking away our sins, His resurrection, defeating death, defeating the gates of hell and his promise of coming again to fully bring heavenly rule. And the gates of hell, the power of this world, the power of sin, the power of the devil, the power of death cannot prevail, cannot overcome Jesus' church. That's what Jesus is saying. Yes, for sure all these things remain a threat and we feel it sometimes, absolutely. But ultimately, they cannot stand because Jesus has declared, it is finished. So can you personally be encouraged by this, this declaration? And I love this. Many years later, Peter himself, as one of the founding believers in Jesus, he says this in 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 4, he says this, as you come to him, to Jesus, who is a living stone rejected by men, in the, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. He's talking to us. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. That's you. You yourselves, are like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying a stone, this is Jesus, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, but this is for us, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. For us, as we confess our faith, like Peter, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, we too are remade, given new purpose, just like in the baptism, and for your own baptism. You and I are declaring we are new creations. We are born again to a living hope. And we are being built by Jesus as his people into his church. So does that not change the tone of how we turn away from our sin and repent? How we participate? How we support and serve in the church? How we repent and turn away from the old life, our old names, who we were. How we participate in the life of God's people, in worship, in true friendship and fellowship. And how we support and serve the church with everything we've got financially and and how we use our gifts with love and generosity. So that's a great call. But how can we live all of this out? Well, we come under the rule of King Jesus. Verse 19, Jesus says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That may seem a bit confusing at first, but here's what Jesus is doing. He's declaring over Peter and over his church those who know him as the Christ, the son of the living God, in faith and in worship. He's saying this, we join him under the kingdom rule of Jesus as king. Jesus, who is the the perfect unity, he's the perfect unity of heaven and earth. He's the, the perfect unity of God and humanity. 
And so Jesus gives authority to, P- to Peter and to all those who would preach and proclaim the gospel of salvation, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and to exercise in the church wise and godly discipline. And you might think, well, I don't know if that, I like that word, discipline. No, it's actually really good. This binding and loosing. You may think, I don't know what that is. And there's lots of things it could mean, but I think this is a kind of summary of it, that binding is to prohibit, to say, to say no, and loosing is to permit, to say, to say yes. So in other words, what should God's people say yes and, and no to? Yes, to loving our neighbor, even sacrificially. No, to hate and abuse of people and this world. The church, the people of Jesus, and the kingdom is the rule of Jesus. They're, they're in a way separate, but they go together. And so what does that look like for us? So for us, we don't individually get the keys to the kingdom, right? We're not like, hey, this is who's coming in and who's coming out. No. Those truly belong to Jesus. So those keys belong to Jesus in a sense. But we are a part of it. We're a part of that life. We're a part of the kingdom of Jesus. Peter is part of the kingdom of Jesus. We're under the rule of King Jesus. So what we do now, we love and forgive. That has eternal consequences. And what we say no to now, corruption and cruelty and and selfishness and pride, also has consequences. Think about this in the way in which we invite people into our lives who maybe don't yet know Jesus. And into conversations that we show generosity and love. Eternal consequences is binding and loosing. We say no to that, but we say yes to love. Now, as an illustration to what, much of what I've said, and I've said a whole bunch of things, and they're pretty amazing things that Jesus is declaring, um, I want to share this. I think it's kind of a, a pretty cool summary. I have this friend, uh, and I've known her for over 10 years. We've been on all these really cool committees together and, and done lots of mission and ministry. She and her husband are both super awesome. And just ever since I've known them, they've been these rock-solid, faithful, serving people in the kingdom. And uh, I was, I'm really grateful to them because they also mentored me in a lot of ways to become a pastor and the youth pastor that I am. And when I, when I look at this friend, Julie, when I look at her, I can, I can see no matter where she goes, whether it was back in Australia, whether it's here in Vancouver or Arizona or Saskatchewan, where they lived for quite a while, and particularly at Briarcrest, and we were familiar with that, or now at Tyndale in Amsterdam. This is what I see. She is continually drawing amazing young women to herself. She's drawing those who maybe are struggling with spiritual stuff, maybe some health stuff, with relational stuff, with with whatever stuff. And she meets with them week after week after week, coffee after coffee after coffee, always opening up the Bible, coming under the kingdom rule of Jesus, meeting with Jesus, to hear who he is, what he has done for us. And here's the thing, that's a lot of work. It's over years and years and years, but this is what I've seen over and over and over again. I've seen so many young people, particularly young women, be so blessed by Jesus through her. And seeing their lives turned around in repentance, turning away from the things that are harmful, turning towards God, becoming amazing Christian leaders and missionaries, and those willing to serve in their home, their church, their community, wherever they are. What an amazing, beautiful picture of my friend, just serving Jesus in his church under the kingdom rule. So, When we live our lives knowing who Jesus is, Jesus transforms us and he transforms all those around us. What a sweet picture. Now, just before we come to the conclusion, I want to make sure we hear this funny last verse in the context 
uh, this whole story context. Because we've just heard Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and all these amazing things about God's presence and his power and his revelation. And then in verse 20, Jesus strictly charged the disciples to tell no one he was the Christ. (laughs) Why would he say this to the disciples at this time? Now, I, I think simply at this point in the Gospel of Matthew, the disciples just don't have the full story yet. They've seen the life of Jesus on display so far but he didn't yet have his death, his resurrection, and the promise of his return in glory. So his disciples and Peter, they don't yet have, and they haven't yet experienced the whole story which we have. We know the end of the story. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He died on the cross for our sins. He was raised to life, breaking the power of the gates of hell. And we know that he will come again in glory. So we can, you and I can preach and proclaim him as the Christ, the son of the living God. So friends, just to wrap it all up, we've asked the question over and over again, who is Jesus? And I ask you, who do you say that he is? And I pray that we can join with Peter. We can join with Peter. Let me read this over us once again. Verse 15. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Amen.